Uh, let's get started. We're going to be reviewing chapter seven material today, which was uh, focused around the alcohols. So we got to start with where we always start when we learn a new functional group, and that is nomenclature. All right, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to work through these on your own, and then we'll go through them together. But our goal is to name these alcohols. Yeah, actually, we can focus on this part first. Real quick, because uh, you're screwed if you don't know this part. What suffix do we use for our alcohols? What's our new ending? Oh, well, all, right? So all of these should end in all.
All right, so let's go through them. These first three are meant to be fairly straightforward. There's nothing too special going on. The second group, these bottom three, you gotta remember some special rules. All right, so let's just go through this. So remember the name of the game, anytime you're doing nomenclatures, you gotta find that parent chain first, that longest continuous set of carbons. In this case, we have one, two, three carbons in our parent chain, which would be, what do we call it with prefix? Prop. Prop. So this would be a propanol. And remember, we gotta indicate the position of that functional group. So I could number it both ways. But of course, the logic here is I'm gonna choose which number is what, bigger or smaller? smaller, so in this case, this would be one propanol. I'm gonna go with that blue numbering scheme. All right, same deal here. We gotta find our parent chain. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a hexanol. Again, we can number our parent chain both ways in case we're unsure. All right, and so again, I'm going to go with the numbering scheme that puts that functional group on the lower numbers. So this would be three hexanol. All right, how many carbons are in my parent chain on this third one? Five. Five. So I have one, two, three, four, five. So this would be a pentanol. We start building from the back end of the name. I have to name this substituent here. Now I got this extra group on there that I haven't accounted for. Uh, what do we call a chlorine? Chloro. This would be a chloro group. Again, put in my numbering. All right, and which numbering scheme am I gonna go with? The uh, red or the blue? I'm gonna go with the red one because that puts my alcohol group on carbon two. So this would be a three chloro, two pentanol. All right, so for these next ones, I gotta remember some special rules here. Uh, again, the first step is always going to be the same thing, finding your parent chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have this one carbon substituent here, which I'm going to call a, what group? Methyl. This would be a methyl group. I'm going to put in my numbering scheme, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Blue numbering scheme, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so let's see who remembers our, our rule here. Which, uh, who thinks we should pick the red numbering scheme? And who thinks we should pick the blue numbering scheme? All right, so remember we gotta prioritize that alcohol functional group. Meaning we're not gonna pay attention to the methyl group at all when we pick our numbering scheme. It's gonna be all about which of these numbering schemes gives that alcohol the lowest possible number, which would be the blue numbering scheme. So let me just, for the sake of confusion, get rid of this. So this would be, um, we got a heptanol, right? Seven is heptanol. That alcohol group is located at carbon three. Whoa. And then that methyl group is on carbon six. So 6-methyl-3-heptanol. All right, how many carbons are in the parent chain of this third, uh, This I guess it's the fifth example here? All right, so the longest continuous set of carbons is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right, it's not always going to be just what's in the line, you gotta find that longest continuous set, so it's gonna be those eight carbons there. And again, I can number both ways, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All 
All right, but again, I'm going to prioritize that alcohol functional group, so I'm not going to pay attention to those other two when I choose my numbering scheme. I do have to name these other two groups. This is one carbon here. We said that was a methyl group. This substituent is two carbons, so it would be an ethyl group. All right, and again, I'm going to prioritize that alcohol, so I'm going to go ahead and pick my red numbering scheme. All right, so I guess if I want to start from the back end, we got a three octanol. Uh, but importantly, now that I have two substituents, I need to make sure that when I list them, what do I do? I put them in alphabetical order, right? When you got multiple substituents, they have to be listed in alphabetical order. So ethyl should come before methyl. So 5-ethyl, 7-methyl. Reoctanol. All right, and so for this last one, I got a bunch of different halogen substituents. I guess first we can do it step by step here. Let's find the parent chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. Uh, whoa. We said that this chlorine was a chloro group. Fluorine is a fluoro group, and bromine is a bromo group. Okay, so I'm going to put in my numbering scheme. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So the rule is I'm going to prioritize that alcohol functional group. But in this case, both of my numbering schemes will put that alcohol on carbon four. Right? So there's a tie where that alcohol group is. Okay? So which numbering scheme am I going to go with, the red or the blue? Who thinks we should pick the red numbering scheme? And who thinks we should pick the blue numbering scheme? Why the red? It is the red. Okay, so once we have a tie with our alcohol group, then we'll look at the other substituents. In my red numbering scheme, I have a 3, a 3, and a 5. And in my blue numbering scheme, I have a 5, a 5, and a 3. So with my red numbering scheme, I'm going to have the lower numbers of my two choices. Two 3s versus two 5s. All right, so that's the tiebreaker. I'm going to pick whichever one has the lower numbering scheme for my other substituents, which is in this case the red numbering scheme. If it was the blue numbering, would it go alphabetical? And then all of a sudden you got to break it with alphabetical, yes. Okay. So if it was like a chloro versus a bromo, if this fluorine wasn't there, then the tie would be broken by alphabetical order. Okay, but because chloro would be equal to Because I got two threes. Three, three, five compared to three, five, five. All right, so I guess starting from the back end here, because this is going to be all sorts of ugly. So this will be a four heptanol. I'm going to take these three substituents, and I'm going to make sure to list them alphabetically. All right, so that means bromo is coming first, five bromo. What's next? Three chloro. Three chloro. And then finally that three fluoro. Flouro, four heptanol. Okay, so the big things to remember are you got to prioritize that alcohol functional group when you're numbering and list your substituents in alphabetical order. All right, those are the two big ones that we have to make extra special sure that we're good about. All right, so take a second and for these three compounds here for which I have named. You're going to give me the structure of these compounds.
right, so cyclohexanol. I'm going to start by drawing my cyclohexane ring. I'm going to just stick an alcohol group on there. Why don't I have to number, why is there no number out front here? All right, so if I were to pick up this alcohol group and move it over to this carbon, then I would just start numbering with this carbon as one, right? No matter where you put that alcohol functional group, you're just gonna call that carbon one, which is why we don't bother writing one cyclohexanol, because again, we know it's implied that it's gonna be on our carbon one. All right, so for these ones, the easiest thing to do is kind of start from the back, right? Start from your parent chain, your nonanol. And non is how many carbons? Nine. Nine. So I'm going to start with my nine carbons. Is that right? Six, 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 nine. Okay. Start counting in onto carbon five because that's where my alcohol group is going to be. One, two, three, four, five. All right, and then I need to put a propyl group on carbon four. What's a propyl group? How many carbons? Three. three. So one, two, three. That's my nonol parent chain, nonanol parent chain, and my one, two, three carbon propyl group. Okay, so again, starting from the back, my pentanol. I'm going to draw my five carbons, two, three, four, five. I have a alcohol group on carbon two. Okay, so that's my two pentanol. And then two, five, diiodo. What the heck is that? Two iodine groups, right? So iodo is for iodine, so I'm going to need to stick one of those iodines on carbon two. The other one is going to go all the way at the end. One, two, three, four, five. Stick that on the end there. All right, two, five, di, iodo. Cool. All right. So here's our nomenclature practice. Um, we're going to go in and start doing some reactions now. I guess let me clarify which numbering scheme I chose. All right, so first up, we need to know our oxidation of alcohols. So you're gonna give me the oxidation product of each of these alcohols, and if there is no reaction, you're going to write NR. Remember this like O in the brackets means one oxidation step. So just one oxidation step, right? So if it's a carbon, remember oxidation means adding a carbon oxygen bond. This is what we learned how to do before we started looking at specific reagents. And we will look at specific reagents here in a second, but.
All right, so is this first one a primary, a secondary, or a tertiary alcohol? Secondary alcohol. So when I oxidize it, remember we kind of have this simple way of thinking about oxidation in organic chemistry where we're just going to add an additional carbon-oxygen bond. So I'm going to uh, convert this alcohol, carbon-oxygen single bonds, to now a carbon-oxygen double bonds. And what do we call this functional group that I just created? So this would be a ketone, right? So the secondary alcohols can be oxidized to ketones. And then can ketones be further oxidized? No, it's stuck there. All right, so ketones cannot be oxidized any further. There would be no additional oxidation step. Um, and importantly, because again, I told, we've been over this a few times, so I told you it was fair game to ask you on an exam. What do we call this carbon-oxygen double bond? We got a special name for it, carbonyl. All right, that carbon-oxygen double bond is called a carbonyl bond. All right, primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol. This one will be tertiary. Again, I'm going to create a carbon-oxygen double bond. Is that cool? What's wrong with it? This carbon right here, everybody's organic chemistry brain should explode because this carbon right here has five bonds in this molecule that I drew, right? So tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized. All right, and then this last one is now our primary alcohol. We convert our carbon-oxygen single bond into a carbon-oxygen double bond. And we call this new functional group that I just drew, so this one's an aldehyde. Can aldehydes be oxidized? Yes, so al aldehydes can be further oxidized. Y'all remember what we call this? A carboxylic acid. Okay, so this was the, um, the first thing that we learned about alcohols with regards to reactions. Primary alcohols can be oxidized to aldehydes, which can be further oxidized to carboxylic acids. Secondary alcohols can be oxidized to ketones, but ketones can't be oxidized, it's stuck there. And then tertiary alcohols can't be oxidized at all. Okay. I'll post this whole document. All right, so now for these four molecules here, we're gonna try to label the hydrogen bonding sites. Specifically, we're going to, if it's a donor site, we're going to circle it and label it donor. And if it's an acceptor site, a hydrogen bond acceptor, you're going to put a box around it and label it as an acceptor. All right, so we got to know what our hydrogen bond donors and our hydrogen bond acceptors are. So take a minute and see if you can't remember uh, how we determine hydrogen bond donors and acceptors.
right, so let's go through this one. Let's sort of try to recall what the heck I mean by donors and acceptors. Okay. So the donor of a hydrogen bond is the hydrogen in a nice polar bond, right? So the hydrogen itself is the hydrogen bond donor. The acceptor of a hydrogen bond is a pair of electrons on an electronegative atom. All right, and really the key, the, the, the thing that we're looking for with both donors and acceptors, again, it has to be a polar bond, it has to be an electronegative atom. The only atoms that are really capable of this are, the big ones are nitrogen and oxygen, but also those halogens, fluorine and chlorine, kind of to a lesser extent, or chromium. We'll keep it at that short list there. All right, those are the only atoms electronegative enough to participate in hydrogen bonding, be it a donor or an acceptor, right? So the hydrogen has to be bound to one of those atoms. The acceptor, that lone pair, has to be on one of those types of atoms. Those are the only four that can participate in hydrogen bonding at all. All right, so I guess I wasn't very creative with my examples. Let me put an example of one that doesn't participate in hydrogen bonding. We'll get to that one here in a second. Okay, so our alcohols, right? We introduced this in the alcohols chapter because alcohols are famous for their hydrogen bond, world famous for their hydrogen bonding. All right, they have both the donor, the uh, uh, hydrogen bound, I said, I guess I said circle it. The hydrogen bound to that oxygen would be a uh, hydrogen bond donor. And then the acceptor would be the oxygen itself. Right. Specifically, that lone pair on that oxygen. Remember, in organic chemistry, we get lazy and we don't draw in our lone pairs. But I know because that oxygen has two bonds that it also has how many lone pairs? Two. two. And that's oxygen's happy state with two bonds and two lone pairs. Right. So in my mind, just by looking at this next example here, I know that I can put in those two lone pairs. Uh, so first of all, what functional group is this right here? An ether, right? So this is actually going to be our next chapter review would be on ethers. This would be an ether here. Are ethers hydrogen bond donors or acceptors or both or what? They're acceptors because they have a pair of electrons on an electronegative atom. So this guy right here is an acceptor. Does it have any donors? No, right? Because that oxygen is bound to two carbons, not to any hydrogens. Right? So this is an example of a molecule that has a donor, or I'm sorry, an acceptor, but no donor. All right, what about this functional group here? What do we call this? So this is an alkene. Are alkenes hydrogen bond donors or acceptors? No, they got no, no electronegative atoms with lone pairs. They got no lone pairs at all. They don't have any sort of hydrogen bond donors. So these are neither donors nor acceptors. All right, this thing down here, we don't really have to know what this is called an ester. Again, I see these oxygens that have two bonds, so I know that they're going to have two lone pairs. Do I have any donor sites in my ester? Right, I don't have any carbon, I, I'm sorry, I don't have any oxygen hydrogen bonds, nitrogen hydrogen bonds, fluorine hydrogen bonds, or chlorine hydrogen bonds, so no, there's no donors in there. Do I have any acceptors? Yep, I got two oxygens, both of which can be hydrogen bond acceptors. 
right? This nitrogen, nitrogen likes to have three bonds and how many lone pairs? One, right? So even though it's not drawn because we're lazy in organic chemistry, I know that there is a lone pair on that nitrogen. Are there any donors in this molecule? Yes, I have this nitrogen-hydrogen bond here. So this hydrogen is going to be a donor. And my nitrogen is going to be an acceptor. So this has both. All right, and this last one here, phosphorus also has a lone pair. Does this have any donors or acceptors? So importantly, nitrogen is not on our short list here. Nitrogen, uh, I'm sorry, not nitrogen. Phosphorus is not on our short list here. It doesn't make the cut. Phosphorus is just not electronegative enough to participate in hydrogen bonding. Yes, it has that hydrogen bound to it. Yes, it has a lone pair, but it's not an electronegative enough atom to be considered hydrogen bonding. So this has neither a donor nor an acceptor. It's got to be one of these short list atoms here. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. Last one is our reactions of alcohol. So these are the same five reactions here, or pretty similar. The difference is, is on the first reaction wheel, I have a primary alcohol, and on the bottom one, I have a tertiary alcohol. So take a second and see if you can't fill in any missing, they're just products, and then right here, I also have a missing reagent. Let's just focus on this top one. Yeah, you will.
All right, so let's go through it. Let's do these bottom two first. These two here. All right, so both PCC and this chromium-6 oxide, they both uh, do what type of reactions to alcohol? What category do we put them under? Oxidation, Oxidation right? So the difference is, is that PCC we consider to be a weak oxidizer, and anything with chromi uh, chromium in it, right? Whenever we see chromium, we think strong oxidation. So what the heck does that mean? The weak oxidizer is going to convert my alcohol into what functional group? An aldehyde, right? So just that one oxidation step. Right, you can go back to that previous oxidation problem that we did, and we said that the first oxidation step for an alcohol will be to an aldehyde, but my strong oxidizer, it blows right past that. It fully oxidizes to a carboxylic acid. Right? So those are the difference between these two reagents. Both of them will create uh, oxidation products. The difference is that the strong oxidizer will fully oxidize to a carboxylic acid. All right, and just note, the other reagent that you're gonna see for the strong oxidation, again, has that chromium in it. The chromium is the dead giveaway. All right, the other weak oxidizer is another three letter uh, abbreviation, DMP. All right, so both of those will be on our reagent list. Both of those are fair game for asking on the exam. H2SO4, I feel like this is a particularly forgettable reagent here in terms of what it does. What functional group is created when we treat an alcohol with sulfuric acid? Alkene, Alkene yes. So these are these dehydration reactions, right? And importantly, my alkene, my new double bond has to be with that, oxygen, uh, with that carbon right there at the base, right? So the only place that I can put it for this particular molecule would be right here. It's a particularly long bond, but yes. That's my alkene that I get from treating my alcohol with sulfuric acid. All right, and what about the sodium hydride? Does anybody remember what that does? Get rid, of, get rid of the hydrogen, yeah. So um, alcohols are not something that we think about as acids. If you go to your chemistry stock room, it's definitely not going to be on the shelf with acids. But nonetheless, if you use a really, really strong base like sodium hydride, or the other one that you could use would be uh, sodium amide, NaNH2. Both of these are really strong bases and can deprotonate that uh, oxygen. All right, so remove that hydrogen from that oxygen. All right, and then hint, hint, nudge, nudge. This corresponds nicely to something else that we learned in the next chapter, which is that alkoxides react with alkyl halides to form what kind of functional group? Does anybody remember? Ethers, correct, yes. So Williamson ether synthesis involves these alkoxide ions and alkyl halides to create ethers. So hint, hint, nudge, nudge. These are two separate rea two different uh, reactions that we learned in two different chapters, but they play into one another here, all right? So this can easily be part of like this sort of reaction web type thing, okay? All right, so now to do, uh, to replace my alcohol group with a bromine. This is really the main reason why I wanted to do these two different reaction wheels here. So let's focus, I know there's a lot going on. Let's focus on this step here for my primary alcohol and this step here for my tertiary alcohol. Okay, both of these are substitution reactions. I'm replacing that OH group with a bromine. Importantly though, we use different reagents for primary and secondary compared to tertiary. Tertiary, we just use HBr, all right? 
For primary and secondary, we got to use something a little bit fancier, and that would be phosphorus tribromide. Okay, so importantly, these two do the same thing, but the phosphorus tribromide is for primary and secondary alcohols, whereas HBr is for tertiary alcohols. Okay, so both of these will do substitution reactions. You'll swap out that OH group for a bromine, but again, we gotta remember PBr3 is for primary and secondary, whereas HBr is for tertiary. All right, and the, for the sodium hydride and the sulfuric acid, actually, no, we want to do the sulfuric acid here. Because again, sulfuric acid is going to react with alcohols to create what new functional group? Alkenes. All right, but we got an, an important consideration with this particular one. I know my alkene, my double bond, is going to include this carbon here. Right? It's got to, because that's the carbon at the base of the OH group. So that's going to be where not my double bond is. But now I have three different choices here. It can be between my black carbon and my green carbon, the black carbon and the purple carbon, or the black carbon and the blue carbon. Right? I got three different options for where my double bond is going to form. Which one is correct here, green, purple, or blue? Why purple? Exactly, right? It's going to form the more highly substituted alkene with that purple carbon, right? So my two options, really the, the other two were equivalent. I could either have this as my alkene or this as my alkene. I'm going to pick the more highly substituted. So we can kind of put a star, more highly substituted. All right, and then for my PCC and my chromium-6 oxide, what are they going to do to my tertiary alcohol? They are going to oxidize, except I got a tertiary alcohol. Can I oxidize tertiary alcohols? No. All right, so they're not going to do anything to this particular compound. All right, so remember that, that little cheat sheet that we created at the top of that previous page. Okay? Doesn't matter because I have a tertiary alcohol, so I'm going to have no reaction. Okay? Cool. All right, so next time we will review our last chapter, uh, chapter 8, before our exam next Monday. Did you want me, you want to take a picture of this? Uh, is it, is it I am going to post it.